Hello YouTube, it's Ewan again. Um, I wanted to do a video with this guy. This is one of my bigger telescopes. It has a primary mirror of 12 and a half inches. That's around 320 uh, millimeters. It's big, it's heavy, it's about 60 pounds. It is a massive, massive telescope and it has a corrector inside here which makes it a very special inside this little tube which makes it a very special telescope it's almost like a uh, Dal Kirkman or uh, corrected Dal Kirkman design it's a Richie Cretian made by Officina Stellare it is a ultra uh, corrected Richie Cretian uh, it has a large uh, imaging circle for big sensors even bigger than what I have it is an incredible telescope he even has a hub to cool it and to keep the mirrors at ambient temperature as you can see here this thing uh, this has heaters on the back of the mirrors and fans there's fans at the back this is a incredible telescope this won me an apod recently and i am very very happy with this telescope it was not always a good telescope um, i first found it on telescopes telescope express's website as a damaged um, lemon as the US expression says basically a useless telescope and it was something that I took a big risk on this wasn't necessarily expensive um, it is much cheaper than some of the Chinese uh, rich Cretans, but it was it was still a big endeavor uh, it had to be collimated the primary mirror the secondary mirror which is this thing here does not have a center spot so that makes it very, very hard to center this mirror in relationship to the big primary at the back. There were other things. Um, it was sold as a telescope with a chromatic, sorry, spherical aberration, which meant the stars were very weird. Now, I, I did cover this in a previous video, but I'll go in more detail and explain it here. Um, it had an extra baffle here that created a almost like water droplet effect on the stars diffusing the light and creating concentric circles we'll look at that in a sec these needed to be rebuilt my friend jim was the person who collimated this and rebuilt these um i actually um i added uh, a special kind of material here to flock this primary baffle so that the contrast is is much higher and this, this telescope is not, it's a pro professional telescope. It was sold as a Proline telescope. It's, it's got things like this would be able to be moved. The secondary would be able to be moved. It is movable through this with a special key. The mechanics are some of the best I've seen. It has a special key that fits in here to move the primary, uh, the secondary, excuse me, and the primary. It is a very, very good telescope. And to be honest, I think it's on par with the plane wave 12 inch. Um, it's actually faster. So this is a 12.5 inch mirror, 1680 millimeters focal length, but it is f5.4. That's very fast. That's um, two, two f-stops faster than my old 12 inch, uh, the Chinese uh, Telescope Express GSO. This collects a lot more data a lot faster. It has a better resolution when it comes to the actual DAWs limit because of the way it's designed. It has a lot of big advantages over um, other telescopes that I had in the past, but it took me about a year to get working. It has a Isato 3.8 inch at the back. Um, I use it with a QHY 600 mono. Either the pro version or the photographic version doesn't make a difference. The only difference is in cooling and some of the other features, but it is a very, very good telescope. Again, it won me an APOD, and NASA published about five of my images taken with this telescope, so I could not be happier. It does have some issues. The secondary mirror here does have some decoloration uh, because of humidity, because of the telescope itself has been through a lot of rough patches with other owners. Um, it was basically left for dead, sent back to TS Optics to be repaired. It couldn't be repaired because there's nothing wrong with it. It was just an extra baffle that was here. And it ended up with me and I couldn't be happier. I am um, amazed by Officina Stellare's workmanship. I know they do telescopes for the European Space Agency. So I could not be happier as being from Europe originally. 
uh, I love Italian products. So this telescope, what, what do I use it for? I use it for medium to small nebulas. I also mosaic with it. Um, I will show a mosaic in a future video that I did. I'm actually going to show it's printed behind me at the North American Nebula. And I've also done a mosaic of the Malat 15 in the center of the Park Nebula. Now, this telescope itself is pretty easy to use. It's very heavy. That's the only problem. I use an off-axis guider at the back that picks off light off the actual light that comes through the uh, baffle tube. And um, I guide with it. So I don't have a guide scope. With this focal length, I highly recommend to get an off-axis guider or an ONAG. Um, it will change your life. It's actually pretty cheap, sometimes cheaper than a guide scope, and it works really well. So given that, let's see what I'm going to show today. I am going to hold this telescope because I'm afraid it's going to fall. So I'm going to go and pick some inside. Let's look at it. Let's look at the state of it when I got it. So you see, these were the issues. I was told by T Telescope Express that this is some kind of spherical collaboration. There's something wrong with the actual mirror inside here, the optics. And I was prepared for a huge six months wait to get this fixed and a large $7,000 bill to recoat and reshape um, the optics. But again, my friend Jim, who's a, an expert in collimation, took this apart, recollimated perfectly, and still this was there. It took us about six months to realize that it's this baffle that was added for larger sensors that's been taken off. But you can see it on large stars, but you can also see it on small stars. You can see the convolution was almost impossible uh, because it created this weird effect, halos around every star. It wasn't pretty. I tried everything. I tried Adam Block's halo tutorial. Nothing would work. Um, the only images I could produce were very small stars the nebulas with very small stars in the field or starless images. And even those, they need to be processed very well. So what am I going to show today? The Lagoon Nebula. The Lagoon Nebula is an impressive target in the center of the Milky Way. It is a large object uh, by my standards. It fits perfectly in the field of view for this telescope. And it actually it is one of the most beautiful nebulas in the center of the Milky Way or around there. Um, it's accompanied by the Triffid Nebula. I did not shoot this with this telescope next year. I don't have much time. The Lagoon Nebula goes up uh, maybe 45, 50, 60 degrees at the most and then goes down quickly behind my neighbor's house. And because it's in the summer, if any AC is on, the stars will start dancing in the guider. So I, I think I imaged this across maybe 12 nights to get about 20 hours of data. So let's see what I have. Now, this is the HA. The HA is beautiful. The details are really good. The lagoon looks really good. Uh, the stars are uh, around corner to corner. Uh, it could be better, but it is really good from what my standards are. And the star size for this telescope is very good. It's five microns across the field, which is very, very good for large reflectors. Usually it is, you, you see massive stars with things like the Celestron, um, Edge HD or the Meads ACF. Without a field flattener, the star size is massive. It's probably twice as much, if not more. This telescope has smaller stars than the Astrograph that's F3. That one is specced at nine microns. This is at five. So this, that's why I'm so excited about it. It's a Ferrari found in the desert and repaired. I can't, and it's also red on the back, so that's why I said Ferrari. It's got red uh, inserts everywhere. Uh, now let's look at the sulfur. Again, the stars look really good. For a telescope that was dead and pronounced uh, lemon, it really works well. The details are good, the sharpness of it. It's not perfectly collimated. I think there's still a one pixel error, which, to be honest, in my, in my seeing one or two pixels, I'm not going to see a difference because of the way my seeing is. Uh, sulfur looks pretty good. The field uh, flatness and the flats applied don't have, they removed all gradients. It's pretty good to look at. Let's look at the last one, oxygen. This is where it's pretty good. There's some noise, but it's workable and it is I was really intrigued to see what I got. So I imaged this object with the astrograph, and I have an earlier video for that. I'll link this below. 
in this. So it was a 600 millimeters focal length and 1680. I didn't know which one's better. Actually, I don't, I never liked wide field imaging until I got the astrograph. I always loved rich field, which is this telescope. So now let's look at my stack. The stack itself looked good. I think that the details in here were um, what I expected. Obviously, the, the lagoon was blown out, but we'll pull that back. The stars were decent sized. There was no gradients. There was no kind of, not even a DV to do here. Everything looked really well. I, I did a blur exterminator on this after I stacked it, after, before I, I stretched it. The stars went even smaller, so I could not be happier. Usually I would have to do one or two star reductions, but now because of Russell's amazing tool, I don't have to, any deconvolute. So what more could you want? Buy it. Um, so the details in the walls of the lagoon are very, very good. Uh, the darkness, the dark nebulosity here looks really good. The dust, you can see very, very faint details. And this is what I look for in an image with a larger aperture telescope. This is why these telescopes are so good. Um, you can see even faint parts of the walls around the nebula, uh, the lagoon. It is impressive. Uh, you would expect to see this from, you know, a ten, fifteen thousand dollars plus telescope. This was a fraction of that, but just because of my friend Jim and our persistence we got here. Um, it is very, very sharp. There's literally almost no noise. Uh, again, the camera's good, but the telescope definitely brings it to a new level. Uh, in total, there's about, I would say, 20 hours of information in this image, seven hours of HA, seven hours of O3, and about six of sulfur. I could have collected more, but that would have taken a month. And it, the heat the heat waves were coming, and this is very, very um, uh, sensitive when it comes to the heat. The optics are really good, but because there's such a large mirror with such a big footprint, it's pretty thick it would be affected that focus would have to change almost every hour. I do have an algorithm that measures every degree centigrade and then moves the focuser, but it's it's hard to get it perfect. Usually you move it by a number of steps, uh, forwards or backwards, depending on your focuser and your, your, your motor. Um, I did spend many nights building a model, but it, it's not accurate. It, it's, it's very good, but you'll still have to refocus when the temperature changes drastically from 110 during the day to maybe 50, 60 during the night, I would say 60. Now I removed the stars like usual. Some stars don't want to go away. This one had to be removed in Photoshop, but it's fine. I did a couple of enhancements. I pulled some of the details out. I did some dynamic background. Um, sorry, some high dynamic range uh, transforms to pull the core back out, um, but clean, sharp, Beautiful. That's all I want to see. From my bad sky with all the air conditioning, the lights, the, the humidity, I don't think you can do more. And the seeing was actually decent for this image. The star size shows that and the, the actual definition around things like, like pieces of the nebula here. These are very, very sharp in my point of view and very, very good for this size telescope from a portal 7. Now let's look at the final uh, image. So I have two images. I actually rotated it a little bit and I like, no surprise, the Stardust version, but the Stardust version looks good. Now, because the nebulosity is pretty powerful, the algorithm bringing back the stars doesn't do an ex a really good job bringing the stars back. So I actually prefer this a lot. Um, it has all the hallmarks of a good image for me and I will maximize it now. The detail is there, the nebulosity is there. You can see the lagoon kind of spilling off, which is something I saw with the astrograph. Um, it has really good detail in some of the pieces around the lagoon, uh, even after stretched and, and, and um, enhanced from a contrast, a um, saturation, and I did some color mixing. Again, it's not the best lagoon I've seen, but it's the best lagoon I've taken. And I have goals to take even better images in the future. But I think that for me, this is a very, very good image. 
I actually did a different image, a com combination between the two telescopes. I thought it was good, but it wasn't as good. This, on the other hand, I think is better than the image I got an input from NASA from. So I look forward to hearing what you guys have to think about it, what you think about this guy, this telescope. And if you have any questions, don't forget to leave a comment. The equipment I used, again, is this telescope, the Officina Stellare 312, 320, Ultra Corrected RC, a QHY 600, and a Chroma Filters, Misato 3-inch focuser, because Prima Luce is the best when it comes to some of these focusers, affordable and precise. Um, an OEG, standard OEG, I think it's a ZWO, uh, 174 mini camera that's a little tube that you put in the OEG and the exposures were 600 second per image, uh, 20 hours in total. So about 42 HA, 42 oxygen and 36 sulfur. Um, I used a Paramount ME1, you guys have seen that red mount uh, in my images. It's, it's incredible. It's really old, but also very, very accurate and very easy to use. This is a carbon truss telescope. These trusses help minimize the actual movement when it comes to temperature. This design was invented by a telescope here in California. I believe it's Mount Hamilton Telescope. And it's a very popular design for larger aperture telescopes, 10 inch and higher. And they even make, I believe, 42 inch RCs or at least um, large telescopes in this design with the trusses. It is a, it is a astrograph as well because it has it is made for, for imaging, the distance between the secondary and the primary, uh, and the speed of it, the f5.4, make it harder to use for visual. You'll always see the shadow of the secondary when you look into the eyepiece. I don't personally use it for visual, I'm not a big visual astronomer. So that's it for today. I'm gonna do a few more videos uh, about the work I did with this telescope, including the APOD image that I got, and also an older, uh, data that I processed recently and I also think it was taken with an older Chinese uh, GSO 12 inch a little bit smaller than this and an F8 much lower but I, I think it's a great image um, yeah I look forward to seeing you in the next video and thank you for now bye